So for example, let's say there's something going on at your workplace and, that, and you need to object to it because it's driving you crazy and you talk it over with your wife so that you've got your head screwed on straight. You say, oh, I've got to say something. And you go there and you say something and you know, you're stumbling and awkward and all of that. But, but you watch the response and maybe you get what you're aiming at, maybe you don't, but you've learned a bunch. You've learned, well, I'm not as coherent as I could be. I'm not as good at putting my arguments together. My boss is more of a son of a bitch than, I, than he thought he was. This is a worse problem than I knew about. It's like differentiated, differentiated. So now the landscape is higher resolution, and so are you. Well, so good. So maybe you're a little bit next, better prepared the next time you have to do that. And so the issue here, to some degree, is don't lose an opportunity to grapple with something that objects to you, especially when the object, objection is rather small. Because that's something you can, you say, well, I can put up with it. It's like, fair enough, like you don't want to make everything into a war. I usually use a rule of three. If we're interacting and you do something that I find disruptive, I'll, I'll note it. It's like, potential dragon, gone. And I leave it be. And then if you do it again, I think, oh yeah, that probably wasn't merely situational, but I'll leave it be, because that's still not enough evidence. But if you do it a third time, then I'll say, hey, I just noticed this. And you'll say, no, nah, that didn't happen. And I'll say, yeah, not only did it happen, but it happened here, and it happened here, and I'm not making this up. So there's something going on here, like, I'm not ignoring it, and we can get to the bottom of it. And then they'll come up with a bunch of objections about why that isn't necessary, and you push those aside, and they'll come up with a few more objections, and they'll push those aside, and then usually they'll get mad or burst into tears, and if you push that aside, then you get to have a conversation. Right, and then you can solve the problem, but man, it's, you gotta be a monster, because first of all, you need six arguments about why their objections aren't gonna stop you, and then you have to not be intimidated by the anger, and you have to not be swamped by compassion about the tears. And then you can have a conversation. And people don't do that. They won't do that. And so they don't solve the problems. And so then the problems accrue. Right? And if they accrue over 15 years of a relationship, they end up, then they end up fat, ugly, and in divorce court. So, and that's, you know, that's not a, that's not a great outcome. It's a, it's, divorce court and cancer are similar in their, in their seriousness. Not always, but, but sufficiently often. So when that error emerges, it's a, it's a glimmering. Now, you know, we talked a lot about the hierarchical structure of goals, you know. And so here, here's, something, here's something to think about. So the thing that announces itself as error has a twofold nature. That's because it's chaos and order at the same time. Or it's because it's all the archetypal structures at the same time. It's the dragon of chaos. It's the great mother, positive and negative. It's the great father, positive and negative. It's the individual, hero and adversary. All of that manifests itself in the moment of error. Right? The archetypes come forward. Did you make an error because you're a bad person? Could be. Now, so, so one of the things to think about with regards to that is, you know, in the Mesopotamian creation story, when... Uh, when, when Tiamat comes flooding back, it's so interesting, that story. You think about what she does. So she's the archetype of error, let's say. The error that can take you out, that can dissolve you in salt water. <clears throat> Tears. Well, she's irritated because Apsu was destroyed, so the, the, the structure is gone. Carelessness has destroyed the structure. Up comes Tiamat, she's not happy. What does she do? She prepares a phalanx of monstrous monsters. It's exactly what the story says. She produces a whole horde of monsters to come at you. And she puts Kingu at their head. And Kingu is the king of the monsters. And later, so he's the ultimate bad guy. He's Satan for all intents and purposes in the Mesopotamian version. It's out of him that Marduk makes human beings. It's out of his blood that Marduk makes human beings. That's a critical issue, man. The Mesopotamians said, imagine the worst monster you can possibly imagine. The king of all the monsters. That's the blood of human beings. Wow. So what, that, what does that mean? Well, it means that one of the terrible things that lurks... <clears throat> let's say that you've been in a long-term relationship and it collapses. Let's say you were... You know, you had a tendency towards alcoholism. You weren't so great with regards to your drug use. 
you're not that conscientious. And you had like four or five kind of low rent affairs. And you know it. Your marriage collapses. Bang. Well, who do you first meet when you fall into chaos? You meet King of the Monsters. And he's you. It's like, why did my marriage fall apart? What did I do wrong? Bang, 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 bang. I did all these things wrong. Why? Because that thing inhabits me. What is it? Well, that's the most horrifying question. Right? Well, that's why. So down there in the archetypal space, all these things lurk. The hero and the adversary. Well, you've just met the adversary. Right? Well, maybe you were a tyrant. That's certainly possible. Maybe everything around you was chaotic. So what do you encounter when things fall apart? You encounter the adversary, you encounter the tyrant, you encounter the catastrophe of nature, and you encounter the dragon of the chaos. And they're all intermingled. You have to sort that out. That's what happens to Ellis when she goes down the rabbit hole, right? She meets the Red Queen. And the Red Queen is always running around, off with her heads, off with her heads. And she says, in my kingdom you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. Right? Down the rabbit hole you meet the archetypes. And so, okay, so back to responsibility. Well, one of the things Solzhenitsyn detailed, you know, he said, well, how do societies go corrupt? He said, it's easy. One little sin at a time. You go to work, someone's lording it over you, you know that they're tyrannical. You don't have the wherewithal to stand up. It's like, okay, you're a slave. And so if you continue to agree to be a slave, you will continue to generate tyrants. Right? And the only thing that can stop you from doing that, I think, is the right kind of terror. It's like, be careful what you give up. Because, and that's this logos, okay, so, so, alright, so that's this logos. The logos is the thing that enables you to mediate between, a, between order and chaos, and maybe you have to have some faith in that. It's like, well, what should you do if someone is harassing you? Well, you should fight back. Okay, what is that? What's the most effective way to fight back? Well, sometimes it's physical, but that's not necessarily for the best. Maybe it's through articulation, maybe it's through analysis, right? You want to be sharp. You want to be able to decompose a problem. You want to be able to formulate an argument and a counter response. And maybe you want to be so good at that that people don't mess with you to begin with. And then you're a perfectly articulate counter monster and you never have to take your sword out. That's, that's the place that you want to be. It's like people should know after three seconds of interacting with you that harassing you will be a seriously bad idea. And then you'll have a perfectly fine time with them. So, and that's part of, you know, so there's some utility in meeting the devil in the underworld. Right? Because maybe he's got something to teach you. That's certainly possible. And, that, and one of the things that you can be taught is that your normative morality, which is basically your harmlessness and your naivety masquerading as virtue, is n completely insufficient to protect you in the world. Especially against the sorts of things that you're talking about, which are tyrant tyranny. Tyrants will push until you push back. It's in their nature. They don't have internal controls. So they just push and push and push and push and push and push. Even kids do that. Like Little kids do that all the time. They'll just push you until they hit a wall. They're actually quite happy when they hit a wall because the last thing a child wants is a universe without walls. It terrifies them, right? They want to see, well, I'm in a swimming pool. There's an edge. They don't want to see, oh, oh, oh this isn't a swimming pool. This is an ocean. I'm in the middle of an ocean. I'm going to drown. That's a terrible thing for children. That's why they need discipline and structure. Because it's consistency and predictability and routine and all the things that are extraordinarily helpful to